I'm here and I'm going to talk about running an open source hackerspace. Uh, my name is Tracy Homer. Uh, I, by day, I work for the Software Freedom Conservancy, which is a nonprofit uh, dedicated to software advocacy and uh, open source, open technology. And we have a booth in the uh, other room if you want to come visit us after this. Um, but in my free time, I help administrate our local makerspace. So Knox Makers is located in Knoxville, Tennessee. It is the southeast's biggest and oldest makerspace. We have 350 members. We've been in existence for about 13 years. And it's like your classic hackerspace model. So it's all community run. We are an actual nonprofit organization, but we're all volunteer run. We are fully funded by member dues. Um, we don't like take any like corporate sponsorships and we are also fully open source. Every class that we teach, every uh, software that we have there is uh, op as open as we can. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how we make those decisions, what kind of tools we have and what software we run, and then like some of the challenges and some of the places where we're not, we're not quite there yet. So we have uh, set out to have some core values, which is what we envision will help Knox makers, you know, keep its uh, core solid and what we use to make decisions about our organization. Um, you can see on here that open source is not listed actually because we feel like it fits under several different of our values. Um, I think that people get into open source technology a lot because of the non-commercialism and privacy and it certainly does fit under there, but we think that it fits a lot better under opportunity because it allows people the opportunity to run their software no matter if they have a Windows machine, Mac, or Linux. It allows them to have not pay licensing fees because the worst would be if they came to the space, they paid their dues, and then they could only use the software at the space because they didn't have the money to get the licensing fees at home. You're not getting ads thrown at you all the time. And it also gives people the opportunity to learn very deeply about the software they're using, which is an example of we have here, which is our CNC router, which is in process. So if you've ever tried to purchase a CNC router, they're quite expensive. So we're home building ours, which is another aspect of opportunity. It's giving us the financial opportunity as an organization to save us a lot of money by not purchasing one and having it straight out of the box. But it also allows for like cross disciplines. So we have a lot of people that are into woodworking, not necessarily into software, but they see this become this getting built and they're interested and they're like, well, how is it run? How do I get my uh, designs onto it? How is it programmed? And they can learn about the software. They can learn about um, the stuff that we're putting into it. And also when you, I think that when you learn an open source software, you tend to n learn more than just like press this button, make it go. Uh, so when you do go to a different software, even if it is proprietary, you know more about the inner workings of it and like how it runs and not just like press this, press this, press this, magic, your stuff comes out beautifully. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunities for that at Knox Makers. Um, and I'm going to go through all the different areas that we have. So this is sort of like our, uh, how we look at different softwares and different tools when we uh, come across something that we want in our shop, right? So green makes sense, fully open, open hardware, open software, great for everybody. Red, proprietary, we don't, we're just gonna say no. We're not gonna teach it, we're not gonna spend money on it, we're going to avoid it at all costs. We don't let our members teach on it. I mean, our members are allowed to use whatever software they want in their own s time and on their own projects. But what we have in the space, we're going to keep it fully open. But then there's the yellow part. Uh, some things you just can't get open hardware for, like a CNC embroidery machine, which I'll talk about later. There just is not any open ones. But um, you can access it via Linux or via plugin or like put a USB in the side of it. So uh, as long as we can find a way to access it without downloading their um, web app or something like that, then we feel that it's, it's not the best, but it's okay. And we'll allow it into the space. We'll allow it 
uh, as long as we teach the open way of doing things, right? But then the problem comes, well, not the problem, but like the challenges are, is like how do we make this accessible to our members? So we have, like I said, we have 350 members of all varying levels of tech experience, all varying levels of other tooling experience. Um, some of them don't have a computer at all. Some of them like programmed in COBOL at one point. Uh, some of them don't care about open source. Some of them, you know, only have a Pine phone because they don't want to like use a proprietary phone. So how do we make this accessible to everybody? And really that is a really difficult problem because we want the people that have the SolidWorks membership or some other uh, proprietary CAD software to be able to come in and still use their designs. So we try and have different applications. We have, uh, we have a web app that you can like load software into that will like uh, take SVGs no matter where it comes from, things like that. So ans asking those questions and going with our members, trying to make it um, accessible to everyone is really at the key, uh, not just open software, but open to people's different experiences. Um, it's taken a lot of thought and a lot of work on how to do that, and I guess I will go more into that in the specific tooling. Uh, so well, here is a map of our shop and the different areas that we have. Some of our areas don't have any software involved at all, uh, like machining or blacksmithing. They barely have electricity, like they're not going to have any software questions. Um, but uh, some of ours are just fully based in software. And we have plenty of uh, members that are, you know, programmers or computer nerds as well. As there's not necessarily a zone for that, but, you know, we have people that are into coding and network, things like that. Um, so the first zone that I'm going to talk about is 3D printing. Uh, so 3D printing, it feels like they, they're very open. Um, Prusa is, like, pretty popular. It's a very open uh, software and hardware. You can build your own. If you buy a Prusa, you can buy a kit. You can get the plans and like print out an entire machine yourself. Um, so it's accessible that way. And um, we also have had other, we've had maker bots in the past. We've had different, um, different types of 3D printers. Uh, we have Prusa Slicer loaded on our computers there so that anyone um, that brings in their own designs can just load it into the computer and then all of the, the slicer is like set up to, um, with the configuration for our 3D printers so uh, they can design it on their own. We also teach classes in FreeCAD. Um, we have thought about teaching classes in OpenSCAD but no one has really gotten it together because it's, you know, it's really difficult to put a class and a talk together like that. Uh, but 3D printing, I feel like, is a very open discipline. Like, um, even if you have a closed printer, there's plenty of CAD programs, there's plenty of design programs and uh, slicing programs where you can make, have open software and it's available to a lot of people. Um, it's a little bit different with uh, resin printers. So this resin printer in the picture here isn't um, open hardware. Prusa does have a resin printer. It's a little bit pricey, so we don't have one. Uh, someone donated this one to us, and we were kind of iffy on it because it has like that Windows web app in order to like load your design onto it. But what we found was uh, Prusa also has a resin printer slicer, so and a Python script or some script that you can take and use the the Prusa slicer and put it into their proprietary slicer, and then it will. Uh, put in your open design and you never have to worry about the Windows app. Uh, there's still some issues because resin printing is uh, smelly and chemically, so we're still working on like getting that onboarded, but that is the reason that we accepted that donation because we could access it without having to download their proprietary app software. We also recently got a um, five head Prusa XL which um, is just really this slide is to show that off because it's pretty impressive. Uh, we won a grant to get that printer, so uh, they're not always uh, 
they're not uh, they're not very cheap, but it's really cool, and I'm excited to like expand our 3D printing zone with these new printers. Electronics, uh, we don't really have any um, machines that have software attached to them. We're working on building a PCB mill that uh, uses Gerbil, but it's not up yet. We do, however, teach classes in KiCad. We teach electronic theory classes that uh, we post all of the class notes on GitHub. Uh, we teach a lot of Arduino classes and Raspberry Pi. So there's a lot of open areas in uh, microelectronics as well. I've actually heard a couple talks already today that mention Arduinos or Raspberry Pis or seen them like all over here. So uh, we also have noticed that a lot of people come in and they want to learn basic soldering. So we've designed some soldering kits and sell those for fundraising and also have those uh, schematics on our GitHub as well, just uh, to make the learning accessible, even if the, and the software, even if there's no software attached, we still have um, all of those plans accessible to everyone. Fiber Arts is an example of our, is more of a yellow, a yellow area, like um, there's no, there's not a lot of open hardware um, in the Fiber Arts section, but we've, found ways to make it work. So we have a silhouette machine, which is proprietary and has their own like little app uh, that we don't like to talk about, but they also have an Inkscape extension. So all of the computers at Knox Makers has that Inkscape extension. We teach classes on how to use the Inkscape extension. We don't teach classes on how to use the other, uh, the other part of it. So then that allows people to use uh, the silhouette machine without ever having to download that other stuff. And actually, I think that Silhouette is, Silhouette and Cricut are some examples of how um, we are able to um, evangelize FOSS a little bit because recently they like shut down your thing, your, you know, you load your design into their software and then they're like, okay, well now you can only have it if you pay a subscription fee. So we use that as a good example about why you shouldn't use <laughs> why you shouldn't use these types of software because you know, don't know when they're gonna turn around and uh, you know change the terms on you. So you own all your projects at Knox Makers. We also have a CNC embroidery machine. So again, there's no open hardware embroidery machines in existence that we know of. If you know of any, please let me know. Uh, so when we were shopping for one, we wanted to find one that would take um, a USB that you could load your designs in with a USB because there is another Inkscape extension called Inkstitch um, that outputs several different formats. A lot of them are usable with different embroidery machines. So the fiber arts woman was tasked with find, find an embroidery machine that can get these types of extensions that has a USB um, option and um, she found one and then she also found one that had like local uh, sewing machine repair support. So that was obviously the one she chose. But Inkstitch is an ex excellent extension. It's really easy to use. I made this uh, pattern in about five minutes this morning. You just load in a vector, you uh, click go and it will make all the stitches for you and you can load that into your embroidery machine. So when someone takes the class, we go through how to use the ink stitch extension. Uh, we give everyone a USB that they can keep and leave, leave their designs on and show them how to load that into the machine. Arts and crafts, we have a couple different uh, machines there. This is our large format vinyl cutter. So if you don't wanna use the silhouette at all or if you have like something bigger, you can use the uh, vinyl cutter, the stickers, I don't know if you can see the stickers on my laptop, but I cut them out on the vinyl cutter. Um, that also has an ink, ink tape. Uh, it's, it's not, you don't even need an extension for it. You just use the plot function and it will print right out of the box. I think that this is like an off-brand vinyl cutter. It doesn't have any uh, like apps with it or anything like that, but you can just plug a USB into your laptop, press the plot function and it will cut out your uh, vinyl for you. Something that we thought about uh, for a very long time was a poster printer. We had one that was given to us and it was used, it was 
it was not working great when it was given to us. So we sort of fixed it up and we used it for a while and then it started not working really well at all. But it was used enough that we thought, well, it'd be a good enough investment that we're going to buy a poster printer. And printers are notoriously uh, terrible for not being open at all. So when we were searching for a poster printer, uh, our main thing that is that we wanted one that was already in the CUPS database, so we know that someone else had used it and someone else had done some testing and at least it had been successful for someone else using a Linux computer. Uh, the really sad bit is that when we got it, it and plugged it in and we're like setting it up and everything, it didn't work right away. And we're all makers, so we're like trying to press the buttons and we're like trying to fix it. And we ended up having to call the helpline and the helpline wouldn't help us because we hadn't registered the serial number with their organization. And it was like so heartbreaking. So we had to have a repair tech come and fix it for us. I mean, that's just really wrong. It was very sad. Uh, but now it finally does work and um, you can use it with any of the machines uh, at the space, even if you run an obscure form of Linux. Laser cutting is our most open area. Our first laser cutter that we had was a small CO2 laser that was built by our members. Um, and then we decided that we wanted to upgrade to one with a much larger cutting bed. And we decided that the most economical way to do that was to buy a laser from China. You can see in the background of the picture. And then we ripped out the brain and put in our own uh, guts that were all open hardware. Um, all of that is posted on our wiki, all the instructions on how we did all of that and the, uh, what uh, software we used for that. Um, so we have our own custom safety on there. If you open the door while the laser's running, the laser will shut off. If you hit the emergency stop button, obviously it will shut off. If you turn off the air filtration system, it will shut off. I'm sorry, if you turn off the uh, water cooling, it will shut off. But when you turn the laser on, the air filtration automatically comes on. So, you know, we're building in these safety features to make it accessible and easy for members to use, even if they've never used a laser cutter before or they're not like uh, a tool a person that uses tools very often. Uh, but uh, it uses Linux CNC to, uh, with the G code to get the G code to the laser cutter. Linux CNC is a pretty old and mature project. Uh, it's used with lots of different CNC machines, uh, mills, lathes, uh, robot arms, basically anything that uses G-code to move something, you can load into Linux CNC. And again, with this, we added our own features to it. So on the right, the, the, this side of the screen, you can see the bed up and bed down buttons. So people can just like press, click this button and it will move the bed up. Uh, for different things. Uh, we can also we also set a bounding box. So if you click on the bounding box, it will outline your old project. So you can um, you can show uh, where your project is on your material uh, and things like that to make it easier for members to use. But how do you get your design from Inkscape to G code? That is a tricky bit. And Inkscape has a plugin uh, called something, something to G-code, uh, but it's not very intuitive. So it just, it's sort of, you have to use certain colors. You can't change the power settings. Um, we're not, you know, it's a little bit difficult if you're not used to like techie stuff. Um, so we have a custom web app that our uh, tech director developed uh, that will, you upload your uh, SVG into it and you can see that uh, all the different colors in my SVG are on the right side of the screen and I can choose which ones I want to engrave, what power I want to engrave it as, uh, which ones I want to cut, which order I want to do them in. And actually it's been upgraded since then. Uh, you can actually load in a raster. It will automatically recognize that it's a PNG and will go to the raster settings so you can set different raster settings. We also have a a custom um, extension that we built for Inkscape that will do a lot of the common things that people want to do with the laser. So hatch fill, which is these uh, hash marks to like color something in with the laser or make boxes or uh, make text into 
um, paths, something like that, so that you can, it's very approachable. Even if you've never used Inkscape before, you can go in and you can output something on the laser fairly easily. We recently also got a fiber laser, which the difference is a CO2 laser will do wood and organic materials. A fiber laser will um, do, will engrave and cut thin metals. It will engrave metals um, and different materials like that. There is not, um, we use Meerkat for that, which is just now being developed for the fiber laser. Like, I don't think that there's any other maker spaces that use it for fiber lasers. I'm not sure if there's any other people that use it for, makers, for uh, fiber lasers. It was originally uh, developed for, um, for CO2 lasers, which is a totally different, like, movement system. So um, with a CO2 laser, the entire gantry moves back and forth and cuts out your material. With a fiber laser, it has a mirror that just moves and uh, engraves your material that way. So Meerkat started developing this for fiber lasers. Our tech director was very uh, in contact with them when we were uh, working on this project and trying to debug it and try and make it uh, usable for the common person who's not like a laser expert. And eventually we have gotten it to work for us and it's been really good so far. Uh, he's even thinking about moving our CO2 laser onto Meerkat in the future or his own personal laser. Uh, we've loaded uh, materials. Uh, fiber lasers are very picky about the materials, like what settings you use. Uh, so we have our own materials loaded in there. We sell like little coins or little steel uh, plates that you can engrave on. Uh, so we preloaded all those materials and then we're working with our members to like, if you put a new material in and you find good settings, share with us and we'll share with everybody else. So it's like opening up all that as well. So those are our tools. Internally, we also use a lot of uh, open stuff. We use um, Wikimedia for our wiki page. We use Nextcloud. We use WordPress for our website. You know, these are all pretty common basic things. Uh, we also have computers available for members to use uh, that run Debian. This one, we try and, this is a very boring picture, a screenshot of the desktop of our computers. But as you can see, like all the favorites are at the bottom. So if you're very used to using Windows or Mac, you've never touched a Linux machine before, you're afraid of Linux, it's so technical, it's scary. Well, it's not really. You can see all the software that you want is listed at the bottom of the screen. You can just click on what you need and it's right there for you. We also have different scripts that will update them all when we find that uh, something that, um, if there's like a package that's not running properly, you can run a little uh, script and it will update all the laptops and uh, so that they're all equal and um, completely ready for members to use for whatever. And those just live at the space and people can come in. So if they design something at home, they can bring it on a USB or if they bring their own laptops in and they don't have Inkscape or they haven't downloaded it yet, they don't wanna try it yet, they can try it out on the space laptops. So it works out really well. They're very helpful, especially if you like forget your computer at home or something, there's always one there. We also use PFSense for our firewall and network in the space. Uh, we do have cameras in the space, despite what we said about being having privacy as a value. It was really important to us being open 24-7 uh, and people potentially being there by themselves and maybe hurting themselves horribly. We thought that having cameras was important. Uh, we use ZoneMinder with a, like a motion sensor on it. Uh, we do not uh, publish it to the internet. We don't use like, we definitely don't use proprietary software that's going to like, you know, sell your face to like some corporation or something like that. Uh, we actually have really strict policies about uh, who can look at the cameras and when there has to be a board vote and it has to be a good reason. It can't just be like, was so-and-so in the shop yesterday? I wanna tell them something. Like, no, it has to be like something catastrophic. Um, and it's like sort of a pain to look, so we don't really want to. It's mostly because someone leaves the door unlocked, which is really bad. We don't, we definitely don't want to leave the door unlocked, but if someone does, you can see it in the background. We see the last person that left and then give them a 
tourist phone call, but uh, it happens really rarely. I think 11 times since we put the cameras in place years ago is the how many times we've had to like log in and look at them. Uh, and they automatically like wipe after, I don't know, a month or something, maybe less than that. So we don't store that data, we don't keep it, we uh, don't give it out to anybody. For uh, member management, we ha also have another custom built uh, member management system, which we keep our member data in. We try not to collect any member data if we don't have to. Uh, we don't collect people's income or gender or addresses or anything about them. It's basically contact information. When did you join? a little bit about yourself. We do collect, uh, we do ask people to submit their photographs because 350 people is really difficult to keep track of. So it's helpful to have your photograph there, but we don't share that with other members. Um, but this is, a, this is the web interface to it, uh, which I've, I've been told I'm the only one that uses it because I'm the membership person. So I'm the only one who logs in and makes changes to that. Uh, we also have an API, so it like do, has different scripts that run that adds you to the, like the mailing list automatically, or it checks to see if you um, you can run. Um, sorry, I've made some shell scripts that will like tell me different things about members, uh, so we can like have a count of how many people we have at a certain time, or how many people are on probationary membership, or something like that. Uh, for our internal chat server, we use Mattermost. We've used that for a lot of years already. Um, it's for members only, and it interacts with our HacksDB as well. So there's a special channel that just runs bots where you can uh, have a little slash command, and you can say, who was that person named Tracy again? I don't remember her. So you can type in people slash people Tracy, and then the, all the members named Tracy will pop up, and you can find out their picture so you can see if you're looking at the right person, how long they've been a member, um, a little bit about them. We also have uh, different slash codes for teachers of classes so we don't have to let them have access to the website and all the people that have purchased tickets and all their information. They can just type slash events, the number of their event, and it will list the people that have signed up for their class. So we can restrict that data access to them without giving them like admin privileges on the website. It's really helpful. This is how we mostly interact with it. Um, it also uh, will uh, run daily and check to see if new people have joined or new people have signed up for Mattermost and stuff like that. So it'll, um, we also have bots that will check our machines, that will ping them once an hour and tell us if something is down or if someone has submitted a trouble ticket, uh, it will also pop up in this, uh, bot channel as well. Um, we do live streaming once a week. So once a week we have a community night, a public night where people can come and show off their projects, show what they're working on, ask for help on stuff, and it's streamed to the internet. So we use OBS to like control the camera versus uh, screen type thing, and we stream to Big Blue Button as well. So we uh, we enabled Big Blue Button back uh, in 2020 when everyone started using video conferencing software. Uh, and we went and did our show and shares on Big Blue Button for about a year. Um, and now we just stream them out for people who aren't available. If they can't come out on a Tuesday night for whatever reason, they can still watch it on from home using Big Blue Button. And we also still use it for our board meetings. Uh, because it makes it easier for members to come if they don't have to leave their house. It makes it easier for me to go if I don't have to leave my house as well. So it's worked really well for us. Um, it's I'm a big fan of Big Blue Button especially. Uh, so there's some uh, things that we uh, could improve on. Uh, it's difficult to change after three, 13 years and 350 members if you set something in place in the very beginning it's really hard to change it. Uh, so that's, that's my excuse. It's not that we don't care, it's just that there's maybe no better option or we haven't found the time after putting out all the other fires to uh, switch over to something new. Uh, the first one is we use GitHub for our code repository. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Software Freedom Conservancy's uh, opinion of GitHub, but it is not good. Don't tell the table up there that I said that. 
uh, but you can come talk to me about it. I, I'd rather that we move to something less corporate, but it's it's really difficult. It's a huge social site, GitHub. I mean, it's like everybody knows where to go. If you say you're on GitHub, everybody knows what that is. So moving off there is not is not risen to the top. It's not a huge priority. And it's, I feel like that's okay right now. We also use Gmail for our email. Again, is what, just what we started. When we started the organization, it, there was a couple people. It was the only option. Uh, we were maybe not as hardcore about open source when we started this, and it was free, and we were broke, so Gmail it was. Uh, we've been looking every once in a while on where to migrate off, but we want something that has, you know, has available for a lot of aliases. You can use uh, different bots to control what go who goes into what mailing list and what. Uh, so we haven't quite found something yet. We've heard a few options, but uh, it would be hard to transfer over. At, like you can't transfer over overnight. It would be a multi-month project. Uh, to do that. So we're still using Gmail for our email. We did use Google Sheets uh, and Google Drive at first, but we have moved away from that. None of the forms on our website anymore are Google Forms. We have them all within. Uh, they're either like custom built, like by ourselves, custom coded, or uh, through WordPress. The biggest one that gets to me is that we use QuickBooks for our treasury, treasurer stuff. That makes me really sad. I'm not a huge fan. I'm, in fact, not a fan at all of QuickBooks and Intuit. They have some serious issues that I won't go into. But there, as far as I know, there are no open source CRM and treasurer and uh, financial things for s like small business type things. There is, or nonprofits. I have looked, the, org uh, the organization I work for uses a very uh, old project that is incredibly technical and would not be accessible unless you're like a legit programmer, uh, which is fine if you're getting paid for it, but if we want volunteers to work on this and they're not like super militant, hardcore, uh, open source, it's really hard to convince someone that they have to learn like terminal commands to do bookkeeping. So we use QuickBooks right now. and. For real, seriously, if anyone knows of any open source bookkeeping software or CRM software, please, please tell me because we've been searching. Uh, the best we found was Udo, which is open core, and specifically their bookkeeping software is uh, subscription based, which is disappointing. Uh, they have other services, so I'm not knocking them. I think that they're a good organization, but what, we're, what we need for bookkeeping, they just don't have. Um, the last thing that we don't have open software for is the keys to our building. And we actually use a physical key, like a normal key that you would use to get into your house. We don't like have a little passcode or a little dongle that you can use to get in. Part of that is because we rent. So like changing the door hardware would be a big deal because our, you know, our landlords need to get into the building. Part of it is the question of privacy as well. So like, we don't wanna collect, we don't wanna know who's in the building when, we don't want to know that information, we don't even wanna collect it, we don't want anyone to know that. Uh, another reason is that not all of our members have smartphones, so you can't have an app on your smartphone because that will you know, enable, like some people won't be able to get in the building that way then. Uh, so, Eventually, we would really like to have like a dongle way to get into the building. Um, if we ever own our own building, we will probably enact this and then have it uh, keyed to the membership database as well. So if someone uh, like quits membership or moves away, we can just turn off their access instead of expecting them to mail their key back in, which is what we do right now. Uh, but um, if we go to a different place where we're renting again and they have a key fob system, it's gonna be a lot of hand wringing because we don't wanna give our data away to them either. So we're not really sure how this is going to play out, but currently we're using the old school way and that is how, uh, that is how we do that at the moment. No software, that is our answer to that one. Uh, this is about the end of my talk. It's been really fun to, tr um, I wasn't a Linux nerd when I started going to Knox Makers and I've since like, become like fully 
everything that I own is uh, running open software and I really love it. Um, I'm open to questions if anyone has any. Uh, otherwise, you can talk to me at the booth or email me at Knox Makers. Thank you. Uh, yes, question. No, yeah. Uh, the question was about the space, how much money comes from membership versus donations versus grants. Uh, the, the long answer is, is that our 990s are public, so you can definitely look that up. The short answer is, is that all of our um, operating costs are covered by membership dues. We have enough that, we have enough members that like everything, we would be fine if we never had any donations or grants. We mostly use, we've never used a grant for operating costs we mostly use them to get cooler tools. So, and what was the name of your makerspace? Conejo Valley Makerspace. Go visit that. CVMake.org. Yeah, I'll totally plug anyone's makerspace. I love it. Uh, did you have more questions? Question? Uh, the first question was, is there ever tension between Linux users and non-Linux users? Uh, and if we could just do this one thing proprietary, would it fix everything? Well, which is what they ask. Uh, and the answer is yes, sometimes there is tension. Um, sometimes if someone, especially in teaching classes, because you get people that are super excited about the projects they're working on, and that's valid. I'm excited about the projects I'm working on. And then they're like, but I use XYZ, and we're like, you can talk about the whole thing, except don't teach people X, Y, Z. And yeah, sometimes it does cause a little bit of tension. Uh, but we try and have it so that if you do bring in your project in X, Y, Z, there's a way to get it into a Linux or an open software so that you can at least do the same thing that way or pass it through uh, an open software, like uh, the web app to get stuff onto the laser cutter, it will take only SVGs. So I've never actually tried to export out of uh, like a different CAD program in an SVG and load it into there, but I'm not sure it works. I think you at least have to pass it through Inkscape and pass it in Inkscape SVG. So sometimes there is, but we, you know, this is how we are, this is how we run, and you can make your projects any way you want, but this is how we do it here. Uh, and your second question was how do we do outreach, and uh, it was a very slow burn getting going. Uh, we did a lot of community building things, we did a lot of interesting talks. We had Every Tuesday when we did like our show and share, we'd have like a talk afterward and like draw people from the community in. Uh, we don't do that as much anymore because our show and shares sometimes like will go an hour because we have so many people showing off their projects. Uh, but sometimes we still do have talks um, about different makery projects or different things that people are working on. So just having a lot of public events uh, and advertising into the community and uh, being a friendly group, that helps a lot too. Um, so does that help? 
I'll come. I'll come to your organization if I'm ever in the area again. Uh, yes. Yeah, I think that if we, uh, the explanation was about their RFID system to get into the building, and I think that another thing that we would, um, another challenge that we have with that is that when we have a trial period where you're allowed to be, a me when you first start to be a member, you're not allowed access to the building by yourself for 30 days to make sure you're like a nice human. Um, so if we had a, prog a program like that, we would want to keep it like normally locked and uh, currently, if you're a trial member, you can just, if there's someone there, they will have the door unlocked and they can come in and use the shop and whatever. So there would have to be some way to, for, some, for it to tell, like, I'm a trial member, uh, let me in anyway, something like that, but without giving them full access. So, but it's a good thought to think about. Yes. Uh, the question was, how do we balance uh, privacy and, s and assessing people's skills? Uh, so we do have safety classes that we require everyone to take. If you want to work in the wood shop, you have to take the wood shop class. Even if you've been working in a wood shop your whole life, you have never worked in our wood shop. So we do require that. And you, it's not guaranteed that you pass the class. Like if you're acting a fool during the class, you, you don't get to be authorized. Um, we put a very high level of uh, personal responsibility, really. Um, we tell people that we don't fault anyone ever for asking a question. We are all here to learn. Everyone has been a first timer at some point. Uh, if you are caught using a tool poorly, like if someone comes in and there's like blood everywhere, that's obviously a reason to look at the cameras, right? So, and then we'll find out who was doing that uh, and we'll have a chat with them. Um, but for the most part, everyone that's come in really wants this place to work and is willing to learn and is willing to not, mostly, uh, not use things that they're not allowed to or things that they don't know how to. And we have lots of opportunities for people to learn from each other as well. Uh, so the question is, how do you balance wanting to do all the projects and making sure that they follow through? Yes? Uh, sometimes things take a really long time. <laughs> so that's one thing. Uh, I mean, like, and the other thing is that I think it, we have a really good core group of volunteers. The board is really committed. The area heads are really committed. So even if it does take a long time, um, it eventually, someone will pick it up. We'll, it's not always only one person working on a project. You've got a team of people that sort of like, if one person has a family emergency, someone else steps in or something like that. Uh, as far as like doing other volunteer things in the shop, we have really cultivated a, a culture of like, of cleanliness, honestly. I've been to some maker spaces that are really cluttered and it's hard to keep them clean, it really is, because like, like you said, your own shop, you can do whatever you want. Uh, but cultivating that volunteerism, like if someone needs a shelf built in the welding, you just like call up all the people who are newbie welders. Hey, you wanna learn, you wanna 
do some skill building. You want to come out on a Saturday and like do a project. Um, but like the big, big projects, like the laser cutter, um, we would want to make sure that it was someone who's going to follow through on something like that. If it's a smaller project and we're not sure that it's going to like end up finished any day, I mean, maybe it just doesn't happen for a long time. It's a lot of, we're really casual. <laughs> So, uh, and that's an expect, that's a, I mean, that's what we tell our members as well. Like, there's no customer service here. Things are not always going to happen in the most timely manner, but it's a community. It's just how we, it's how we go. So, yeah. Uh, the board, yes, but also we, uh, we have our area head. So each of the zones has uh, what we call czars and czarinas that run them, they run the budgets, they decide what projects to do, they decide what tools to purchase. So they would sanction something like that. Um, the, a lot of our things, not a lot of our things are home built anymore, unless we find like a super good deal on Craigslist or something, and it's like something in horrible shape and we like have to clean it up. Uh, but we're sort of in the financial place where we can purchase things, uh, maybe not software, but like machines, we can purchase them. So you had a question. That's a very loaded question. <laughs> uh, have we had any drama or um, antisocial behavior? So the 30-day trial membership is sort of how we get around that. Like, if people can't uh, keep it together during that time, then they don't get to become members. Uh, and that doesn't happen very often. We do have uh, what we call peace officers, which is like a third party that if you're having a misunderstanding or something, you can go to them and they will help you, like, both parties work it out anonymously. If there is, like, a harassment or some other like serious issue we would just kick them out like we don't tolerate um we don't tolerate any of that stuff at all so that's really our policy is uh don't be a dick is our policy sorry it's just <laughs> yes Uh, the question is, what is the division between volunteers and members and management team? Uh, well, ideally, every volunteer would be a, or every member would be a volunteer. Like, that is how we talk about it. Like, if you come and use the shop, at the very, very, very least, you have to leave it cleaner as when you came in. Like, everybody volunteers here. Everything that is done here is done by us. As far as um, management team, we have eight board members, we have one person in charge of each zone, and each zone has like, some of them have deputy people. So like the wood shop is really big, it's way too big for one person. So he has like small, like not smaller, but like people under him that like are authorized to fix the tools. But honestly, anyone who comes in, if they see a project on our project board that needs doing, go do it. I mean, everyone's a volunteer. That's the, that's the answer that I'd like to give, is that everybody's a volunteer. Yeah. Mm Uh, the question is, do we have an issue with people leaving their projects laying around? Um, and sometimes uh, we also give the area heads like their own decisions. Like in the wood shop, that's where the bigger projects are going to be in the wood shop. Electronics projects are, you know, this big, not less of a deal. Um, and he does allow people to leave projects there for a couple weeks at a time, as long as it has your name on it and the date and it's being moved forward, that's totally cool. Um, 
there is each of the areas has like a little corner that people might store their stuff as long as uh, it's not being obnoxious. And honestly, as long as it has a name on it and it's moving forward, you know, people actually get interested in it. Like, oh, I saw that last week and now it looks cooler. Um, we do have personal storage. Everybody has personal storage if they want it. So it's just some shelves with some bins on it. You can leave small projects or PPE or something like that. Um, the first question was, do we have multiple levels of membership? And the answer was no. Everyone has the same uh, rights and responsibilities. We do have different prices, like we have lower prices for students or people on fixed incomes, um, but they still are fully members in every other way. How do we keep track if people are checked out on the tools? Uh, that is an option within HacksDB that I'm pretty sure no one uses, sorry. Uh, I know that when I was teaching authorization classes, I was not using it. Uh, you can keep track of tickets in, um, in WordPress and that I suppose if we, if we thought that someone wasn't authorized, they, we would go back and check on that. I mean, I suppose we should try, start trying tracking that, which is honor system, right? A lot of things is done on the honor system. Um, which is another reason why the door access project never really got off the ground is because we thought feature creep. We thought, oh, we could make this not only into door access, but we could make it into tool access. And then we could put them on all the tools and you'd have to key card into a tool only if you have access. But then there was so many questions about safety and like people walking away and like how long does that do work if you code, if you like flash your key or something and then it just never got off the ground. <laughs> uh, maybe a couple more questions, one more? Yeah. Uh, the question is how do we handle uh, physical accidents or liabilities? Well, everyone has to sign a waiver when you come into the space. We have very expensive insurance. Uh, and I'm happy to say that only two people ever have had to like call for help because of an injury. So uh, is that answer your question? It's, I mean, we, ask, we have them sign a waiver that, uh, you know, we basically tell people like this place is dangerous and it is, you know, it's up to you to keep your own self safe. So, which is why we require the safety classes and we teach them and we encourage people to ask questions. And uh, if, you're, if you're questioning your ability or questioning the tool, then back away and wait. So, I think that's it. Yes, one more. Uh, the question was, is the 30-day policy 30 calendar days or 30 sessions that you're under observation? That second one sounds horrible to administrate. <laughs> uh, it is 30 calendar days um, from the day they pay their dues to 30 days after that. And we do also have like a little onboarding session where you have to come and listen to me and one other guy talk about how, you know, how to be a good member and stuff like that. Um, but it is 30 calendar days and we do, but we do require them and ask them to like come and show your face, interact with people. We've really found that it is the best way to, uh, you know, make sure that they're good humans is to just talk to them and, you know, get a feel for the space and get a feel for them and like how are you going to interact with other people. So um, it is 30 calendar days. All right, I think my time's up. So thank you.